Welcome to another edition of Careers That Matter. Joining me today is Rudy Boutinol, uh, who is the president of CARP, the Canadian Association of Retired Persons. Rudy, what exactly is your job? Because, uh, like, what do you do on a daily basis uh, as the president? Well, I'm only um, uh, early on into the job. It's an organization that's been around for a long time, but the pandemic really, um, really hurt it because of the pandemic, as it did a lot mm -hmm. of things. So mine, uh, you know, it's an executive job. You know, I've gone from a creative executive job in broadcasting to really an organizational job. And I guess it reminds me of kind of my business uh, school experience. The, the 101 of business school is leading change in organizational renewal. Mm -hmm. And that is trying to figure out what kind of an organization do I have? What should it be? And what do we need to get there? And so my job right now is to figure out how do we renew and build uh, the association. It's an association. So it's not like you've got uh, divisions that you're paying for everything. Uh, and you say, do this, do that, and they, and they go, okay. So, like, how do you work within the, like, the series of associations and, and organizations that fall under this umbrella? Uh, do I have that right? Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, you know, I do at, in, in Toronto. Um, I have a, uh, a small staff, paid staff, as well as a paid staff in uh, Nova Scotia and one uh, representative in uh, Surrey. But uh, we work with chapters. Uh, 23 chapters across the country, and they're volunteer chapters. And that's where my experience uh, throughout my career being on volunteer boards has really come in handy because with, an, with a staff, you have the power to hire and fire, and you've got the ability to group them together on a common cause and, and are responsible for their performance. When it comes to volunteers, you can't tell them to do anything. You, you know, because if they don't like what you're doing, they'll just walk away or not show up. And that you have to engage uh, volunteer boards differently. You have to motivate them uh, to want to pursue their own best interest. And that's a totally different side of the job. So you got to be a pretty good salesperson. Yeah, part, a, a pretty good. Yes, a pretty good salesperson. But you also have to be the um, you have to deliver. Yeah, you know, uh, sales gets them in, into the tent, but then to keep them there, you have to uh, deliver on whatever it is that you promise. So, as this collective, do you bring then uh, uh, opportunities? I guess that uh, create uh, better pricing, discounts, uh, access to uh, legislators, and so on that individual groups or organizations that fall under the umbrella may not have access to on their own. For sure. The part of our power to be able to get um, benefit partners that offer fantastic discounts uh, to our members is based on the fact that we have hundreds of thousands of members. Mm -hmm. So there's the power in community. And that's why my slogans have been join the community, discover the benefits. The part of the, the main benefit of advocacy, do something good for your community. Help advocate for a better life for um, uh, Canadians as they age. Uh, but the trigger is, and by the way, with a $20 membership, you can get uh, a huge discount on hearing aids, um, on mm -hmm. uh, you know eyeglasses, on travel insurance, on group travel, uh, and everything like that. So balancing uh, the public purpose with then the individual benefits. So real, you know, that's a day-to-day -day job. Okay. So on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, what what does a typical day look like for you? Like. What are your tasks and how do you allocate <laughs> that time resource to doing different uh, aspects of your job? Well, uh, one thing that I've learned early on in terms of managing my own time was not to put the thinking time and reading time at the end of the week. Uh -huh. And I prioritize it and do it first thing in the first of the week. I, take the, the, I don't book things Monday mornings. I do that to read the research, uh, do the thinking I need to do, and not meet unless it's an emergency. Uh, because that's the really quality time that says, this is what I'm going to accomplish this week. Uh, so a big part of my time is uh, supporting my, my employees, you know, su supporting them, seeing what they need and, and constantly directing them and uh, constantly getting through the message of what we're supposed to do, both at the big scale and at the micro scale. And, you know, nowadays I'm on the phone less and on the email more. You know, lots of emails, lots of writing. Well, and you also do interviews from time to time. 
Yeah, I love that part of it because I love engaging with people, and there's nothing there's nothing like engaging people, mm-hmm. um, you know, face to face because they people want to see what you look like, how you sound, what your body um, uh, postures like. You know, they want to get an idea of the whole person. So I like doing this. So let's go back to the beginning of your career. Yeah. What did you study? Like, did you uh, go through a post-secondary educational uh, process? What did you study and what did you hope to be at that time? Um, mm-hmm. I came out of high school. I had been a self-taught filmmaker on Super 8 mm-hmm. and Quarter Inch Audio Tape, which was horrible. Uh, but I was, I'd had a success in, in showing my first school project to the entire assembly of school. and and. You know, it's the first time I'd ever done anything like that. And I had this huge round of applause, and that was incredibly addictive. But it was the idea that somebody had taken 10 minutes to listen to what I did. And so I wanted to go to university and pursue life as a filmmaker. The only degree-granting program in Canada at the time was at York University, and it was a fine arts program. And, um, you know, uh, there were polytechnics that also offered the program that were just as good, but I had promised my parents... Uh, that I would be the first member in our family to go to a university. So it had to be degree granting. I went to York. I studied fine arts uh, and majored in film. Then where did you go once you graduated? Well, I came out and uh, I remember we used to, the last year, we were the film majors, the smaller cohort that had made it through the whole four years. And uh, people from the industry would come in and talk about how it was a a wasteland out there. (laughs) Forget about (laughs) it. So I came out. And realizing there was no, there were very few supports. There was the film board, the CBC, very few jobs, nothing else. And that was the beginning of what would become the independent production industry. Mm-hmm. And so I was one of those that goes, well, you know, rather than sitting around, you know, let, let's do something. So instead of paying off my student loan, I borrowed some more money, bought a state-of-the-art edit, editing machine at the time, film 16 millimeter. and um, Real to real. Yeah, the yeah. steam back, you know, yeah. on the flatbed. And uh, my thinking was, if we rented it really cheap, you know, we'd buy, we'd rent some really cheap warehouse space. And if we um, rented it cheap during the week, we would meet all these people in the industry. <laughs> and then on the weekends, we would uh, both, you know, be the maintenance people. This is with a partner mm-hmm. and uh, would work on our own film. And so I started doing that uh, and it, it was a great way to meet people in the industry and turned out to meet a lot of people who end up making a career in, in, in the industry for the last 50 years. So it worked. Yeah. You're an entrepreneur right out yeah. of the starting gate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I was. I realized that at that time, we, you know, you couldn't wait for anybody else to do anything. And so because I had an, a studio... It became kind of a central meeting place. And so all of a sudden people would show up and go and uh, and there what we realized is we'd been working independently. And as a joke, people said, you know, we have no uh, dental program. We should maybe get together as a group. And so a bunch of us started meeting in my office every, you know, the first Tuesday of every month after work. And the deal was, look, somebody's turn to bring a beers. And uh, here's the deal. We come around. And information was very sparse from networks. No, you, no one knew, no one published what they were com- uh, commissioning at the CBC, and, mm. uh, right? It was all insider stuff. So our deal was, look, we come here, and to be part of the group, you have to exchange information. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you, you, you have to let everybody know what you're doing. What information do you have? It's an exchange. That ended up growing, and I became um, the founding chair what became the Documentary Organization of Canada that spun off Canada's largest documentary film festival called Hot Docs. And then I ended up realizing, hey, this is, you know, we're actually getting ahead. We help change policy, um, making the Canada Film Development Corporation into telefilm, which, and we said, hey, you're not supporting independent documentary. We should lobby for that. So we lobbied successfully. And then having on the tails of that, uh, I thought, well, the Academy of Canadian Cinema doesn't really have any documentary awards to speak of. So I joined wow. the board and uh, helped lobby for the expansion in the film awards with the Genies and then the expansion with the Geminis at the time, the television awards. And then end up asked, being on other boards, like the television, Canadian Television Fund that became the Canada Media Fund to just lobby for independence. And through that, um, you know, I got engaged, uh, met a lot of other players, understood the landscape better, 
and uh, help you know grow professionally as well. Where did you go after that? Because so you, you grow this, but then you moved into the broadcast sector. Yeah, so for, I'd been an independent for about 18 years, and it was interesting in the last years, I, my, I was following the, the film, uh, the space program, and I was starting to get contracts out of the newly launched History Channel in the United States and the Discovery Channel in the United States and PBS because I'd had developed this expertise with the space program. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, um, commissions for history or uh, technology documentaries. And just as I was having this great success, uh, Canada was opening up to the independent commissioning model and TV Ontario was leading at the time and they were looking for someone that would commission. And because I was so engaged with the community, um, turned out that that was a really big asset. They thought, you know, a commissioner doesn't commission their own work, they commission the, the work of the communities. And I had a national a natural affinity for it, so I ended up getting the lucky guy that got recruited to launch the commissioning program at TV Ontario. Uh, the CBC followed about six months later, and then from that I, um, once I got inside, I told my boss, who was a giant in the industry named Peter Herndorf, just a, a fantastic man, and uh, 18 months into it, he used to call me, when I met him, he called me the filmmaker, the filmmaker. And then 18 months into it, I said, stop calling me the filmmaker. I want to become a broadcaster. And he said, oh, really? Well, he had this library. So he interested in case studies. And he, uh, yeah. What, and so he would pull a book off his shelf, take off the dust cover, wrote my name on a sticky pad so I had to return the book. And I started reading case studies of past broadcasting histories. Hmm. And... Um, and I just consumed them and I, okay, what should I know next? So I learned about broadcasting and scheduling. And I, every time there was an opportunity, every time there was some kind of restructuring, I went to the boss and said, don't hire another person. I'll just take it on. And wow. by the time, um, you know, because I could turn that position to cash. And uh, so by the time I started as a commissioning editor and I ended up as a creative head of network programming. So I was responsible for um, the entire programming schedule, uh, traffic, on-air membership, uh, branding and communication. I learned everything. And I was also the executive producer of Saturday Night Movies, which is fun, and continued to commission because I would just, um, you know, rebuild the model. And uh, I did that for 13 years. And I, want, I was pursuing the public television model, but right. under a regime change, they want to go back to educational. So that wasn't for me. And about eight months later, the um, Knowledge Network in British Columbia had emerged from privatization review. They wanted to rebuild it. And I had this opportunity to totally recreate the network with this idea that I had developed over 13 years. Wow. And uh, so one led to the next. Yeah. And... Uh, and also at the same time, I continued the volunteer side because I had, as a commissioning editor, I'd understood the um, international broadcasting scene. And I would, I would and continue to moderate these international documentary financing forums. And that took me far afield. So I do a lot of, uh, I've done them in Asia, the Middle East and uh, in Europe. And that's kept my hand in it. In fact, just this past fall, I was in Sarajevo to do one sponsored by Al Jazeera. I was in Rome to do the, um, the Rome media for mostly Europe. And then uh, in Germany, where I teach a workshop and moderate. And that keeps my hand in broadcasting and in the global movements of, of trends. And I just, it's just fantastic. So what would you say is the one uh, attribute that you possess that has been fundamental to you succeeding in your career? Well, part, I think being a self-starter, you yeah. know, but um, I, I, I was passionate about storytelling. I didn't, I didn't think I called it storytelling. I think it was like, I want to be in film, but I was really passionate. I realized that it was something I could do and do well and that I could be rewarded, if not financially at first, certainly with applause. And I realized I'm just going to do this. I'm going to commit myself to do this. I'd sit down to do a budget with my wife. And, you know, of course, it's easy to put all the expenses down. Well, how much is rent and food? Yeah. And then the revenue side, no idea. And I realized, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to do it. And so, you know, it was being a self-starter, but being driven by an idea, a vision that this is what I want to do. This is what I want to devote my life to. So, so somebody might say, oh, but you were a risk taker. Uh, what I am actually hearing is, no, you were a believer in the possible. 
Yeah, I, I think so. And but even a believer in the possible, there's risk. You mm-hmm. know, it doesn't mean you know as as you you know when you describe it as I have, it's like wow, that was a smooth road. It's a lot of trial and error. You have to you know suck up your failures. And, uh, you know, <laughs> after you feel sorry for yourself, you have to figure out, okay, where did I go? Where did I go wrong? What was the part that I played that I could change? You can't change anything right. external, but you can change what you do. Yep. And, and so I always, um, in any kind of activity where I've succeeded and failed, but mostly where I failed, I always go, uh, you know, okay, I'm the number one actor in this. How can I change that? How can I change what I did? And, um, I think that's been a really important aspect of self-assessment and being really truthful for yourself because it's the one advantage you have. It's the one thing you know you can definitely change. Well, thank you for giving us a little insight into your current job and your career path to this point. Mm-hmm.